Because interplay is creates video games, right? What was Blizzard doing at this point? The same thing, right? They were also creating video games. So if if Interplay had bought Blizzard, right, they would force them to maybe design games the way that Interplay does. It's kind of like this, right? If you're an artist, right, and you sign with, a, like, like you decide to like play with another artist or like join another artist's group, right, they'll want you to be like everyone else in the group, kind of like this. But Davidson didn't have any experience in creating games for consumers, people who play games for fun. So they basically said, listen, we'll take care of all the business side, the marketing, the sales, all that stuff, we'll take care of it. You guys can do whatever you want. When we're buying you guys for $6 million, you guys can do whatever you want. And that was really one of the best decisions that they made. Because had they gone with Interplay, maybe Blizzard wouldn't even exist today. You know, maybe it would just be a part of Interplay, and, and that's all. They would not have created the great games that they did. So really, they made a lot of really, really great decisions when it came to investors, right? It's really, really important to, especially when you're thinking about running a business, right? If you guys are really good at what you do, you know, if, if you guys, if everyone has a background, right, and they under, like for instance, if we're all fashion designers, right, and we come together and we decide that we're going to start our own line of clothing, fashion clothes, like fashionable clothing, right? We don't, you know, we believe in ourselves. We think we're talented. We think we have a lot of knowledge about what people want to wear, right? The types of clothes that they like, the types of designs that are going to be really popular. It's really difficult if you have an investor who always tries to come in and say, no, I think you guys should do it this way. I think you guys should do it this way. It's kind of like having a boss who's really tough to work for, right? A boss who's always interfering with your work. That's something that, you know, it's the same thing. When you have investors, right? And on one hand, they have that right, right? Because they own a certain part of your business. If we're telling a company, right, a bank, if we're asking a bank to invest in us, or uh, you know, a private group, a private equity group, right, to say, give us $1 million, we'll give you 20% of our shares. We'll give you 20% share of the business. They have a right to come in and tell us. But the really intelligent people who are investors, they look for people like Blizzard, people who know what they're doing, right? And you, and you can see them and you can tell that they're talented, that they have a lot of knowledge, and they're very dedicated, right? So all, you, all you're doing is you're giving them the fuel. It's like they're a car. And all you're doing is you're putting in the fuel and you just let the car go. You don't have to drive it. Let them drive it, you know? You just wait for the products to become popular. And then, you know, the $1 million that you spent buying a 20% share, maybe eight years from now, it's gonna be worth $100 million. That's what, I mean, that's basically what happened. Later on, Blizzard, I forget when this happened, but they were bought by a French company called Vivendi, which is actually owns the Universal Group, like Universal Studios and stuff. They're actually, it's all part of the same company. But Vivendi followed the same, um, and you can look this company up later on, so it's a French company. But Vivendi followed the same approach, right? They had the same philosophy as Davidson. They still, to this day, Blizzard doesn't have to answer to them. They simply act like shareholders. They're like, listen, you guys can do whatever the hell you guys want. Because they proved themselves, you know, because their, their games were so well received. You saw from a really, really early point, like in the early 90s, when they made Rock and Roll Racing and the Lost Vikings, they won two of the seven awards that are given out every year. And they were the only company, this tiny studio of like 40 people, right? They were the only company to win two awards. So. You could tell that these people were really talented, right? You could tell that these people were, were very, very talented. They knew what they were doing. And it's really to Davidson's credit that they realized this, that they didn't try to interfere um, in what, what Blizzard was doing. And that's something that's really, really important. If you guys, no matter what side you guys sit on, right? If you, if, if you guys win the lottery one day, or like if you guys earn a lot of money and you become investors someday, right? It's important for you to realize that, you know, there's a time and a place. Sometimes a company wants investors who have expertise, right? Who have experience in the same field, right? But most successful investors, what they do is they look for talent, like these guys, right? And they'll just say, I'm just going to put the fuel in the car. I don't have to do anything else. I'm just going to put the fuel in, and the car is going to drive by itself. And, you know, whenever I want to sell my shares, if you know that you've invested with the right people, you're going to make a huge profit, right? 
So this is like in the, so th these are like things to think about. And if you guys are ever thinking about investing, you know, a large amount of money in a friend's business or like a small business that you think is going to grow a lot, you guys are obviously going to read a lot more, but it's important to understand what are some of the things you look for when you're thinking about what company has the best chance to be successful, to be worth the most money later on, right? So these are some of the things, right? So we've talked about versatility, the people, right? We've talked about the company culture. These are all really, really important because when you have, you know, versatility, right? When you have a small number of people, you still have to do the same type of work. 20 people have to do the same work that 100 people do, right? Company culture. People love working for the company. They really believe that they're doing great things. And really them picking the right investors, right? So there's a couple more things. What are what are some what are some other things that you guys noticed? Shin, what did you notice in the video? Um, like they they have a good relationship. A good relationship with who? Uh, like the founder, because uh, they met at the same university. Right, right, same right, class. Right, right. And as he said, that they use the same password. Yeah, yeah, that's so right. In the beginning, they probably use the same something like a, uh, you, you, I, fate, I see. fate. It's kind of like it's almost like it's almost fateful, isn't it? It's kind of like there's there's fate. So that's really good. That's kind of that kind of ties into the company culture, and and, uh, and so what we what we can talk about now is. Let's talk about Blizzard's product development, right? Because there's, there's hundreds of companies that create video games, right? There's hundreds of companies all over the world. What makes them special? Because right? this is really the, the theme of this week, right? Blizzard is an interesting way of looking at product development and thinking about really what makes them special. Can I ask something? Yeah, of course. Right. But what's the meaning of crunch? Crunch, OK. When you're crunching, it's it's an adjective. What it means is that you're working really hard. <laughs> when he's saying that, you know, like it's like this, when you're when you're when you're creating a game, right? Towards the end, you're working the hardest. Because you know, you're trying to meet a deadline, right? You have to get the game out by December 5th, right? Let's just say that's your date. So the closer that you get to that, you have to make sure that the game works properly. You have to make sure that all the technology is right. You know, so when you're crunching, that's like kind of like when you're working the hardest. So when he's saying, you know, we crunched for a long time, that means for months and months they were like working seven days a week, basically, till like midnight every night. Then go back home, go to sleep, come back in the morning. It's like all they did was like work on the game, basically. Um, right. Okay. Well, yeah, respond for crunch. C R U N C H. So this is like a word that's used in like a lot of, like, you know, you, you could be like crunching on something, like when you're eating like chips, right? You, you're crunching on chips, basically. But in this sense, when you're crunching at work, it means that you're working really, really hard. And a lot of times, it means that you're looking at very, very minute details, right? So you know, if the landscape for a game is created, you're looking for something wrong here. You're looking for something wrong here, right? In the beginning, it's easy. You're just designing the big, you know, the, the big landscape, right? You saw, like, for instance, like in StarCraft or any of these games, you have these big maps, right? But you're looking for little things. Right? This is when you're crunching. When you're looking for the little things, and you're really just trying to make it perfect. It's like when an artist is putting the finishing touches, right? Right at the end, when, when you're looking at the canvas, you're, you're going back, and you're like, OK, the color's a little bit off here, a little bit off here. That's when you're kind of crunching, right? You're just trying to make it as perfect as it can be. It's never going to be completely perfect. But if you get close enough to perfect, it's going to feel like it's perfect, right? So. But that's the meaning of crunch in this sense. But let's let's talk about product development, right? One of the things that you know I think is really really interesting is that they're taking you know like they're saying there's always been racing games. Look at the very first game that they're talking about, right? But they're saying you know we wanted this game to look really really unique. If there's 100 racing games in front of you, right? They're all the same. It's like you control a car, you press the up arrow, you're going fast, you hit shift, like you know you're going faster. You know what I mean? It's like there's all these types of car games. But he said, what can we do to make our product unique? And this is something that is a law for any type of new venture, new business, right? If we have this fashion company, right, what makes our clothes unique? What makes our clothes unique, right? What makes, 
when you're walking and you see all these different sweaters, right, or cardigans, what makes me want to buy this, right? And not like this or some other type of sweater, right? So really, what makes, and, and it seems like, you know, even a t-shirt is such a simple thing, but what makes it unique? And really what they did is when you look at rock and roll racing, right, you saw that they, they added, you know, spaceships, right? They added like laser guns to the cars. They, they had all these, they had crazy music playing in the background. It's just, you know, when you're looking at all these games, suddenly you see rock and roll racing, what the hell? Like this, it, it's like, this is a racing game? And then you see it really is a racing game. It's just, it has all these unique features, right? So let's write that, let's write that one down, right? Now, a feature is basically an attribute, right? A feature is basically like something that, you know, it could be like, okay, this, this car, right, can, you know, like, remember we were talking about fuel efficiency. Remember in the very first week? A feature of the Zero S motorcycle is that it's very fuel efficient. It has an athletic build, right? Remember some of the things that we talked about? So what we're saying is that these games, Blizzard games, have unique features. Something about them makes you stop and say, I want to see more about this. I think this art style is really interesting. The colors that they're using, the, the way that the cars look, right in the Lost Vikings. You saw like the little things, like the different types of puzzles and stuff that they have. Something about those games is really, really unique. Because the thing is that, you know, all these games, right? The concept for, you guys are familiar with Lord of the Rings, right? Lord of the Rings from like the 70s or whenever it came out, they have orcs, right? These green skinned, like, they look like humans, but they're bad guys, right? So things like orcs have always been around, but you know how Samwise, the guy with the long hair, he was saying, uh, the long hair and the bearded guy, right? Sam was saying that, you know, we wanted our orcs to have like horns and to have like carry these big swords and just look really different from everything that's out there. You know, we, we want, when someone looks at one of our orcs, they should feel like I've never seen something like this before, right? The concept that never, seen before, right? In the past, if something is really, really unique, it's really groundbreaking, right? It's something that, you know, I've never experienced something like this before, and that's something that is really important in terms of, you know, them, their games having this identity, right? So unique features is one of them. The other thing that's really interesting is that, you know, they sort of using I want to say like, you know, they talk a lot about, and this is a little bit um, advanced, but they're saying that they use 3D technology, right? At that time in the early to mid 90s, 3D technology in games was really, really like new. People weren't really like sure how to use it. 3D was something that was used in like movies sometimes, but people weren't really sure if we can use this for games, right? So what they did is they challenged boundaries, right? So let's say they challenged, technological boundaries, right? And so when you challenge something, right, you're saying that this is, th this is a barrier, right? It's unknown. You, there 3D technology exists. We're not sure how it can be used for games. So it's kind of like you're standing in front of a gate, right? and you don't know how to open the gate. It's like a challenge, right? So what they're saying is that, or, or it's a barrier. So they're challenging that barrier. They're saying, you know what? We think we can use this. We just have to think about it, and we have to test it. And they started testing it, and they really started using the 3D technology in their games, right? So that's a technological boundary. That's a boundary that you're given, right? That you can't cross this because people don't know what's on the other side. So that's something that, once again, contributed to their games having this unique feel, this unique feature, right? But here's another thing that they did, right? That I think, you know, that really, really stands out. And this one's important because this takes a lot of courage, but it basically is that, right? They had a lot of courage. What do I mean by that? Did you guys see, when they were originally designing StarCraft, which is now one of the most important games ever made, right? StarCraft really, revolutionized, right? You know, when you think of a revolution, a revolution means change, 
right? StarCraft revolutionized video games. You know, th there was never a game like that before. The combination of the story, the way that the gameplay was, right? So what's really interesting over here is that they had cards, and what I mean by that is, remember when they were first designing StarCraft, they said that they took it to this convention, right? And everyone was like,